Hello and welcome again. In this video, we'll talk about the security of the LGML signature. Um, uh, the first thing we're gonna look at is something that it was also a problem for the RSA, which is forgery. So forgery means that the attacker Eve can impersonate uh, Bob just by replacing the public parameters with her own public parameters P prime, alpha priming, and B prime. So if that is the case, if Eve could do that, then Eve could sign messages and then Alice will believe that those messages were signed by Bob. So that's one of the problems of the Elgamal also, which is also shared with the RSA signature. That's the forgery. So, so that's one thing. Now, one thing that uh, we mentioned also for the RSA is that this can be uh, prevented using certificates, something that we, we haven't covered yet, but it can prevent can be prevented use doing that. Now, the other thing that is also a problem here, and if you recall, the Elgamal is based on the security of the discrete log. So what that means is that, that if the attacker Eve can compute discrete logs efficiently, then she can compute the private key and the ephemeral key, both of them. Now, that is pretty bad because if Eve can compute the private key, that means that she can sign the messages and make Eve believe that she's the one sending the messages, which is not the case. Now, let's see why is that the case. So this is going to be actually very similar to the Elgamal encryption. How do you attack the Elgamal? Now, recall that the public parameters of the Elgamal signature are the prime P, alpha the generator, and this number B, which is uh, the modular exponentiation of alpha to the private key. So B actually has kind of inside hidden the information of the private key because if you remember, B is the generator to the private key, which in this case we denoted by B modulo the prime P. If you look at this equation here, so what that really means is that this B, the exponent, either this is a discrete log and base alpha of B. And that's always the case, of course, it's always like that. And what happens here is that this alpha and B are known to everyone. In particular, they are known to Eve. So if Eve can compute this discrete log, then Eve can compute the private key. So B, will that will be uh, pretty bad. So what it says here is, which is what I mentioned, that if Eve has the private key, then she can sign the messages, which of course defeats the purpose of the Elgamal signature. Now, she can also actually compute the ephemeral key because by the setup of the of the way that the signature is produced, remember that the signature for the Elgamar is a pair of numbers. It's a number R and a number S. Then number, the number R, the way the signature algorithm is computed is the generator alpha to the ephemeral key modulo P. Modulo the prime, modulo the prime number. So what that means again is that this exponent is the discrete log in base alpha of R. So an alpha and R will be known to Eve if she's listening to the channel. That's part of the signature there. Assuming of course that things are not encrypted. So assuming that Eve intercepted that package. The package is the message with the two numbers that correspond to the signature. So she can compute the private key and in this way. So how can she compute the private key? Okay, one thing that she Eve also knows because Eve knows that they are using the Elgamal signature. That's one thing that Eve has to know also to do all of this. Is that for the Elgamal signature, the specification of the Elgamal signature is that this R is alpha to the ephemeral key modulo P, and also the way the this part of the signature is computed as is this formula here is the message minus the private key times R, which was computed before, times the inverse of the ephemeral. Uh, key, this is all modulo P minus 1. Now, if you look at this, this is basically just an equation. So if you go ahead and here and multiply by the by, by the ephemeral key on both sides, then basically what you have here is S times the ephemeral key, and then here this one basically cancels out. So S times the ephemeral key is equal to this expression that is here. Now, why is that important? The reason this is important is because from here, you, for example, can move this BR to this side, 
and this s times the f metal key to this side so you can get this equation that you see here this is basically just doing algebra so this all computations that i'm doing here is just algebraic manipulation which can be done because that's also true in congruence so once i put it in this uh, fashion if you look at this uh, congruence that I have here, I only have one unknown. The unknown here will be B, assuming of course that you are Eve. So Eve already knows what R is, what the message is, what S is, and the ephemeral key, which can be computed using the discrete lock that is here. So once she has the, uh, the, this, the ephemeral key using the discrete lock, all these numbers that are here, all the ones that are marked in yellow, all of them are known to Eve, assuming, of course, that Eve already computed the ephemeral key using the discrete logs. So using this information, this is a linear congruence, um, and the only unknown here will be B, so you can actually compute B from here up to a certain point. So there's a, uh, is, there is a bunch of uh, numbers that come out of here. This solution is, of course, not unique, but then then Eve can now actually check which one of those is actually the private key. Alright, so let, let's see an example. Let's see an example where, where Eve, the attacker, can compute the private key if the numbers are small. So for example, let's assume that the public parameters of the Elgamal signature are uh, 607, 191, and 80, and this corresponds to the prime number, the generator, and the number B, that is produced with the modular exponentiation of alpha and the private key. Now, here, of course, I don't have the private key, so the purpose of the example is actually to compute the private key from only this information. And that, of course, is possible because these numbers are small. Okay, so what do we know? So we know that the private key is always, is always the discrete log and base alpha of this number B that is here. So in this particular case, I have that the alpha is 191 and B is 80 which is this one here now because these numbers are small enough I can actually go ahead and use the baby step giant step algorithm to compute the, this, the discrete log here like, again this is all possible because these numbers here are small so if you actually go ahead and compute the discrete log in this case you get that the private key is 15 which is this computation actually doesn't take that much time if you actually for example, if you program this in Java or any other language, it will take just a matter of seconds for these small numbers, of course. So, as I mentioned, uh, this is all possible because numbers are small, so that's, so then anyone actually looking at the public parameters could compute the private key, which is not very good. So, again, to prevent this type of attack is similar to preventing uh, the hardness of computing this, of attacking this, is depends on whether or not you can compute the discrete log. And so to prevent that, uh, what you need to do is you must choose your prime key P here of at least 10, 24 bits. And also another requirement that is also coming from uh, the discrete logs is that the odd factors of P minus 1 must be large numbers. So if the prime factors of this are small, there are attacks that can be done and the discrete logs can be computed that way which we didn't go into the details of that, but that's something that is possible. Now, something that is also um, a security risk using the Elgamal signature is if you reuse the ephemeral key. So in general, and this also goes for the Elgamal encryption, if you remember what we did, uh, it's not uh, suggested that you use the ephemeral key uh, several times. So this is the reuse the ephemeral key and we will see that when you use the ephemeral key it will be possible to actually find the private key. So that's also uh, pretty bad. So let's say for example the Bob which is the person who's gonna sign the messages here uses the ephemeral key uh, K sub E then in that case we will see in a second that Eve can easily compute the private key which is the one that is important here for doing this the signature. Okay, so let's look at this uh, kind of example here. So let's say I have my public parameters P, alpha, and B, which are the, for the Elgamal signature. Bob has 
his private key, which he keeps, of course, secret. And he wants to, and he's sending two messages, one M1 and M2, with the corresponding signatures R1 S1 and R2 S2. So he sends these messages to the insecure channel. Alice gets those messages, and of course, she's gonna go ahead and check that the signature could correspond to the message, which actually checks because that's what Bob uh, did. Same for the second message, which is the message I am two with the corresponding signature sent through the insecure channel. Now, if Bob reuses the ephemeral key, what that would mean is that these numbers R1 and R2 will be exactly the same. And the reason for that is because how do you compute the R is always alpha, the generator to the ephemeral key. Alpha doesn't change, it's always the same. If Bob doesn't change the ephemeral key, then R1 will be this, and R2 will also be that. Now, if he uses another ephemeral key for this other message, then this equation here won't be valid. But because he uses the same ephemeral key, then this is true. So one thing that Eve can realize is, if she's listening to the channel, and this is not encrypted, then she can realize that R1 is equal to R2. If that happens, then for sure she knows that the ephemeral key has been reused. So that's what I say here. So the attacker Eve noticed that R1 is equal to R2, therefore the ephemeral key was reused. So now that's where the problem comes. So now that the Eve knows, the attacker knows that the ephemeral key was reused, she can use the facts of how the Elga model signature works to actually get an solution for the um, private key. So let's look at that. So Eve knows that the following is true. And these two equations that I have here are true is because that's how you compute S1 and S2. S1 and S2 are part of the signature using the Elgamal. And for the Elgamal, the part of the signature S1 is always the message, which is in this case the message M1 minus the private key times R. And what is R here? R is the common value of R1 and R2. Because remember, we are assuming that they are exactly the same thing here. R1 and R2, they are exactly the same. Let's call that R times the inverse of the ephemeral key modulo P minus 1. S2 is also computed in a similar way. You just use the second message, M2. You still have the same private key, which is B. R is the same because the ephemeral key was used uh, twice. And of course, these ephemeral keys are all the same. So I have this uh, old two equations, one and two, uh, that I can use or Eve can use. Now, if Eve intercepted the packages, so it means that she knows all this information, M1, S1, R1, and M2, S2, R2. Actually, I uh, reverse here. This would be R1. Let me just change it here so it doesn't get confusing. So this is R1, S. This is R1, S1, and R2, S2. The R1 and R2 that you see here, the R1 and R2, they are the same. So in this case, R1 and R2 are the same as we mentioned earlier. So the equations one and two have two unknowns actually, if this is the case. What are the unknowns here? The private key B and the ephemeral key here. Now she knows that they use the ephemeral key, but up to this point, she doesn't know which one is it. Now she knows everything except for B and this one. S1 is known because that was part of the signature. M1 is known, assuming that this was not encrypted. M2 is also known. B is not known. R is known. That's the common value of the R's and the ephemeral key is not known. So everything but B and the ephemeral key are known and this are unknown in, are in these two equations. So what we're gonna do to actually uh, solve this system, if you look at this system in terms of the algebra, college algebra, you have two equations and you have two variables. The variables are B and the ephemeral key. So in theory, it will be possible to actually solve for B in this. You have two variables, two equations in general. Well, there are some conditions that have to be met in order for this to be solved, even in uh, normal algebra. So, and we'll see what the conditions are so you can solve it. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do something that is very algebraic. So I'm going to just take and subtract these two equations. I'm going to get S1 minus S2, and I subtract these two. When I, when, when I take this one and I subtract this, you see this BR times the ephemeral key inverse, they're going to cancel when I do the subtraction. So I just get the following thing. So when you do the subtraction, you get S1 minus S2 congruent to M1 minus M2 modulo um, times the ephemeral key inverse modulo P minus 1. You can actually double check that from here just using some algebra. And now from here what I can do is I can multiply on both sides by the uh, ephemeral key. So on this side it will cancel out and I will have the ephemeral key here on this side. And I'm going to make a point right now. So once you have this here, now how many unknowns do you have here? Well, you only have one unknown, which is the ephemeral key. Anything else is known here. All of this is coming from the packages that were intercepted. So I can solve for the ephemeral key here. The ephemeral key here will be just multiplied by the inverse of S1 minus S2 modulo P minus 1. And I'm assuming here that that is possible, meaning that S1 minus S2 has a multiplicative inverse modulo P minus 1. So in G this will be possible if I can find the inverse of this uh, element modulo P minus 1 in a multiplicative way. So I already know what the value of the ephemeral key is, which is all in terms of this, which is known to Eve because Eve intercepted that message. So she knows all of these values here. So once she knows the ephemeral key, from there, it will not be difficult to find the private key, which can be done in this way. Uh, one thing that I mentioned here, and I don't want to forget, is that uh, S1 minus S2 has a multiplicative inverse. S1 minus S2 and P minus 1 do not have any common factors. If that happens, then you can actually go ahead and find the multiplicative inverse. So now with equation 3, we can solve for, for the private key B from the equations 1 and 3. Now the equation 1, remember, was this one which is, this is how you compute part of the uh, signature in terms of uh, these numbers here. And what I can do here is from this equation, I can multiply by, by the uh, ephemeral key on both sides. So I get S1 times the ephemeral key equals to this M1 minus BR. This is all modulo uh, P minus 1. All right, so what do I have here? So from here to here, what you have to do is you take this one, move it over here, and take S1, uh, the ephemeral key, move it over here. So I will have B times R congruent to M1 minus S1, uh, the ephemeral key, that's all modulo P minus 1. Now, I know this is a lot of algebra, but the, the point here, the important point here is if you look at this equation that I have here, number 4, I already know what the ephemeral key is because I computed that. You remember, let me scroll all the way up from here. I know that what that is. All this is in terms of things that Eve knows. Now, the ephemeral key is known. S1 is known. It's part of the package. M1 is known. It's also part of the package. And P is known because that's the public key. So all of this here is known. Also, R is known. So what you have here is an equation that has only one variable. So in this case, it will be possible to actually solve for B here. And that's, um, that's what I mentioned here. So it's also one unknown, and I said a linear congruence. Linear congruence is because it's just not really an algebraic equation. It's a congruence equation, basically. And it can be solved uh, using congruence. And we will do that in the next video. So in the next video, I'm going to use all this uh, kind of discussion here, which is kind of it was kind of kind of abstract here, just in terms of variables and equations. We'll see an, an example where Eve uh, can compute the private key if she is listening to that channel and she intercepts the uh, the messages and realizing that the uh, ephemeral key was used uh, twice. So I'll stop the video now and I will see you in the next video with an example.